colorful plants, delicious foods, and some of my favorite garden delights, all coming up next. I'm Alan Smith. You know, I'm feeling a little indulgent today. So in today's show, I thought we'd focus on some of my favorite things from the garden, like fresh lettuce. I'm just crazy over lettuce. It's so easy to grow and so delicious. Now I grow lettuce on a small scale, and I'll give you some tips on that coming up. But maybe you've seen this lettuce in your grocery. It's hydroponic, and the way this is packaged, roots and all, means it's almost as fresh as if you'd grown it yourself. Now, if lettuce isn't your thing, but color is, then you're going to love this place. It's Carlsbad, California, where they're growing this beautiful bloom, the ranunculus. Did you know that no two blooms are alike? We'll find out why coming up. And we'll discover a tradition of the Deep South in fried dill pickles with a trip to Natchez, Mississippi. Plus, I've got some interesting viewer mail about a plant that can grow inside and out. It's the bird of paradise. Now, while this show is chock full of my favorites, I'm sure you'll find a few favorite plants you'll want to add to your list, both for the kitchen and for the garden. Lettuce is coming up next. Have you ever discovered a plant that just captured your imagination? Well, I know this may sound a little dull, but lettuce is one of those for me. I just love growing lettuce, both in the spring and the fall. I always plant my regular favorite varieties like butter crunch, red sale, and red oak leaf. But I always try to make room for some other new varieties as well because there's so many to choose from. Here's a nice little lettuce mix from my friend Renee Shepard. Renee grows many of the mixes she sells in her trial garden located at her home in California. And during a visit there, I was really impressed by the array of colors found in a single seed packet. Whether it's lettuce or other salad greens, they are so easy to grow, and I want to show you just how simple it is. You can grow these in a container. I call it a living salad bowl. Now what I've done is I've taken a large container here and filled it with a basic potting soil mix designed for container gardening. And I've filled it up to, well, about an inch to the top lip of the container. Now I've moistened the soil, so I've got a dampened seed bed. Now what I'm going to sow here is just some arugula. Let me show you these seeds. They look like tiny little BBs. And the same rules would apply if I were planting lettuce. I'm just going to generously sow the seed across the top of the soil like this. All right, that should be plenty. Gently pat them down a bit. Now just water them in, like so. All right, now I want to add about a quarter of an inch of soil on top. This is the way I like to apply it because I get even distribution this way. And all you want is just a very thin layer. Again, just about a quarter of an inch. Then pat it down and then hit it one more time with water. You'll be amazed whether it's arugula or lettuce, it will germinate in oh, five to seven days. And within 30 days, you'll be harvesting your first crop of salad greens. Now, throughout the growing period, I'll fertilize this with a dilute solution of an all-purpose fertilizer. And I'll place the container in a full sun location. Renee showed me how she gathers her salad greens. You see, it's very simple. You just cut the leaves above the crown. And then in a few weeks, you'll have a second wave of salad mix to cut. Now this is the way Renee and I do it in our tiny little vegetable gardens. But maybe you've noticed that in your grocery store, you're seeing more and more gourmet lettuces, like Hollandia Live Gourmet. This product gets its name because the plants are packaged, roots and all. Let's visit their huge indoor farm just outside LA and see how they grow lettuce hydroponically. What makes our products different from uh, the regular vegetables is the greenhouse conditions. They're all perfect. so. We control the environment, the amount of water, all the nutrients to exact numbers. And this results in, in very high quality vegetables. Since it usually takes several days or even a week for vegetables to get from the farm to the store to your kitchen, by the time you, you use it, some of the 
vitamins and nutrients have already broken down and they're, they're not there. So we leave the roots on, that way they're, they're as fresh as they could absolutely be when you get it home. It's still alive, they could last a week or two in the fridge. Some people add a little water to the roots to keep them fresh. This ensures you get all the nutrients. These are the gutters where we grow the lettuce. We plant the young plants in here. They get watered about 150 times a day, depending on how warm it is. So there's pretty, water pretty much flowing through there the whole time. The water is constantly being monitored for the correct levels of the nutrition and also the pH. And this water goes out to the plants just how they want it. And then we capture it and bring it back and, and filter it and sterilize it and water with it again. So all, all of our water is recycled. Since we're also controlling the environment, we're able to create a nice environment for predatory insects. So we release literally millions of predatory insects every year to control the harmful insects instead of using pesticides. The lettuce plants grow in these gutters for about five weeks, then they're ready to harvest. We just pull the whole plant, roots and all, out of the gutter and we put it in um, what we call a clamshell container. The container protects the lettuce from getting beat up during shipping and it also keeps a nice climate in there for the plant. So it's not really growing in there, but it's surviving. It's just like harvesting from your own garden. Looking for a way to use the lettuce you grow or purchase at the grocery store? Don't forget to check out my website for great salad recipes. Up next, the colorful and extremely unique blooms of the ranunculus. Stay with us. Wow, just look at all of this color. Welcome back. I'm Alan Smith, and I'm standing among 8 million ranunculus plants. You know, the hundreds of thousands of visitors that come here each spring are a testament to the magical allure color creates. Michael Cordoza tells us more. Now, what are you doing with all these flowers? Well, the biggest part of it's for the show. There are actually two elements to the crop. We'll harvest about 8 million tubers out of the crop this year, and then we'll pick about 2% of the available cut flowers. Only 2%? Just 2%. <laughs> There's just a zillion of them out there that this crop will produce on site. Oh, it's just amazing. How many people will come here to see them in bloom each season? About 200,000 visitors we'll have annually. So they, they're the beneficiaries of all these blooms? That's correct. So what are you looking for in an ideal bloom? Well, here's a good example. This is, this is kind of what we're looking for, is a nice full flower wow. with a lot of doubleness. Look at that number of petals Gosh. that's in there. Feels like crepe paper. Have you ever counted the number of petals on a flower like this? No, we never have, but it'd be a great project for some of those little kids that come out, you know, <laughs> to figure out just how many petals are in there. We also look for nice, good sturdy stems and good height on the plant. You know, there's such a range here of flower shapes. Uh, I mean, this one is very different from that one. I mean, that looks more like a zinnia. Yes, it does. Or a calendula. And then this one, very different yet, but they're all ranunculus. So you can just imagine how much painstaking selection has gone on over the last 70 years to be able to select to this type of an example. I've got more colorful beauties ahead, so stick around. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome back. In today's show, we're having fun with food and flowers, and I'm taking this opportunity to share with you some of my favorites, like lettuce. Earlier, I showed you how to grow your own fresh salad mixes, and we checked out a hydroponic farm where they sell the entire lettuce plant. Now, how about that for fresh? We also saw the beautiful ranunculus field in Carlsbad. What outstanding color. Now, I want to talk a little bit about some of my favorite plants. I've divided them into three categories, but they're all what I call workhorse plants. First would be the shrub roses. They're often overlooked and underestimated, but they're fantastic for the garden. Now the next important category would be shrubs. They bring so much structure and texture to my garden. 
And the third category would be late blooming perennials. They come back year after year and give me that late season splash that makes the garden so special in September and October. Now let's start with the roses. In my front garden, I have an exuberant shrub rose called Russell's Cottage. You see, it blooms only once in the spring, but it's full of these fragrant magenta to almost violet blooms. I like shrub roses because they can be the ideal backdrop to other plants. Just look at how Russell's Cottage forms a nice green screen behind the other border flowers such as foxglove and hollyhocks. It also is an attractive way to give my garden enclosure and privacy. Among the perennials, I like to include plants that bloom late in the season, such as perennial sunflowers, the blue mist flower, sometimes called perennial ageratum, as well as goldenrod. I grow one in my garden, which is called fireworks. I love its horizontal branching and flowers. And for shade, a couple of my favorites are the tiny flowered toad lily and Japanese anemone. Okay, let's talk about one last thing, and that's shrubs specifically ones that flower. A few of my favorites are viburnum, hydrangea, and camellia. And in order to keep flowering shrubs blooming like this, don't forget they have to occasionally be pruned. In my opinion, proper pruning makes all of the difference in the way our shrubs and trees look in our gardens. For me, it's very disappointing to see plants that have been incorrectly pruned or pruned at the wrong time of the year. Everyone's seen for scythia and quince and others brutally clipped into rounded balls and shapes that look like large light bulbs. This destroys one of the most beautiful aspects of these shrubs. They're graceful natural shapes. Now just a few weeks ago, this bank of forsythia was in full glorious bloom. With the flowers faded, my goal now is to preserve the integrity of the form. Now rather than going across here and clipping the top of them with shears, I'm going to go into the center of the plant and remove many of the older canes. By removing the canes or stems from the base of the plant, this encourages lots of vigorous growth in the form of long, graceful boughs. It gives an old plant a new lease on life. You see, if I prune this shrub by just lopping off the ends of the stems, I would produce lots of little twiggy stems at the end of the large one. This would make it top-heavy and awkward-looking. By the way, these are the same principles I apply when I'm pruning many of my large old-fashioned shrub roses. You can see there's really nothing to it. It's all about following common sense and a few basic ideas and remembering that old rule of thumb about when to prune. If it flowers after May the 15th, you want to prune it in late winter and early spring for lots of bloom in summer. If it blooms before May the 15th, like this forsythia, you want to prune it as soon as it finishes flowering this Allen's Mailbox segment is brought to you by Western Red Cedar Lumber Association. Real cedar, there is no substitute. On the web at realcedar.org. Okay, it's time to take a look at some viewer mail. Now today's question comes from Sue in Destin, Florida. She writes, I have a bird of paradise in my house. It's about three years old. I give it plenty of sun and I feed it regularly, but I can't seem to get it to bloom. What's going on? Well, Sue, there are a few basic things you need to know about this outstanding houseplant with a gorgeous bloom. I too have heard that root-bound bird of paradise bloom better. Maybe it's because it takes between four to six years for the plant to mature. You can expect blooms in the spring and sometimes later in the summer. While this plant is a splendid houseplant, these tropical beauties can be found growing outdoors where temperatures don't regularly drop below 28 degrees. So if freezing isn't a threat, these plants can grow into massive clumps reaching 30 feet or more in height. Of course, they don't grow that large in a container. Like so many house plants, the bird of paradise doesn't like to be overwatered. so keep the soil slightly on the dry side. It'll always respond best when placed in full direct light. Feeding is important too, and I recommend a well-balanced solution of liquid fertilizer a couple of times a month during the growing season. Just hold back a bit on feeding during the fall and winter. Now most of us are familiar with the orange flower, but I happen to like the white bird of paradise. There's nothing like these blooms to give any flower arrangement a tropical, if not exotic, flair. Now just think, if you give your houseplant all the tender love and care it needs and have plenty of patience, you can produce beautiful flowers like these. Now if you have a question, feel free to check out our website. That's pallensmith.com. Not only do we have an extensive search engine, but each week in our newsletter we post a sampling of questions and my answers. 
Up next, a southern delight that's out of the ordinary. You've got to see this. When you grow up in the South, you find there are lots of interesting things to eat, like boiled peanuts, pickled okra, and grits. But it was a trip to Natchez, Mississippi that introduced me to the culinary delight, fried dill pickles. My goodness gracious, a dill pickle deep fried. Yes. Well, I guess a hallmark of Southern cooking is anything fried. Well, these um, have been in Natchez for as long as I can remember. You always get to have a fried dill pickle. If it wasn't a cock of the walk before that, it was another little drive-in. Mm. And my grandfather made them at the Eola when I was growing up. Oh, they're delicious. They certainly have a unique flavor. Well, they're just a plain hamburger dill soaked in a milk batter with no salt in them because the pickles are salty enough on their own. And then they're rolled in flour and deep fried. And I can't give you any more of the recipe because I'm a franchise. It's a secret. It's a secret. And if I give it to you, I have to kill you. <laughs> okay, well, I don't want you to do that. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to enjoy these anymore no. if you did that. Tell me about how the cock of the walk got its name. On the river, before the steamboat came along, the mode of transportation was a flatboat. And each crew on the flatboats had a man that was considered the cock of the walk. They were the rough, brawly, fighting breed of men. And one man was the meanest and toughest of them all. And he got to signify his right by sticking a turkey feather in his hat. And each boat that went down the river had a cock of the walk on it. Thank you, Patricia, so much. It's Thank been very you. enjoyable. I enjoyed it, too. Now, you may have to work up an adventurous appetite for those fried dill pickles. But if you get a chance to try them, I recommend going for them. That's it for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed being together as much as I have. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile